Aloha, everyone, and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kelee Akina, your host and president of the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. Today's topic is Hawaii's puzzling coronavirus rules. As you know, there have been a multitude of government proclamations, mandates, and shifting rules during the coronavirus pandemic. But you may be wondering, have Hawaii officials been fully transparent about the data and the reasoning behind their actions? Maybe sometimes you've scratched your head. It's been puzzling, to say the least. Well, to find the answer today, we're going to talk with a good friend, Cam Napier, who's the editor-in-chief of Pacific Business News. We'll be discussing what the government could do to be more responsive to the public and more transparent. I'd like to welcome Cam to the program now. Welcome. Glad to have you back with us today, Cam. Well, thanks for having me on the show. It's always a pleasure to be here chatting with you and, and all the Grassroot Institute fans. Hello, everybody. Well, we, we love to tap into your expertise and your wisdom. You are one of the most respected journalists here in the state. As I talk to people, your name comes up when I ask who, who do you respect in terms of journalism, and you've certainly earned your your place here. Uh, give me a little bit of your background. You, you know, one of the things you do is it once in a while address a, a controversial issue. Uh, how did you start doing that, and, and how did you get into journalism here? Oh, my. Uh, well, I've been writing since I was a child. I, it, it just comes naturally to me. It, it's uh, how I learn about what's going on in the world is to read and, and, and ask questions and then kind of synthesize it. And uh, and I've been a, a columnist, I guess, by nature, my, my whole career, all the way back to the cane tassel at Waipahu High School in the 80s. How about I that? School paper. Uh, and uh, I was an English major at the University of Hawaii. I had no idea how to make a living as a writer, but uh, you know, one thing led to another. I was freelancing around town for publications like Honolulu Magazine, Honolulu Weekly. A lot of people might remember the Weekly. Uh, That's they, were, right. they were around for a good long time, um, and uh, ended up uh, being on staff at Honolulu Magazine for oh, about nineteen years. Uh, the last eight as editor, uh, and then I've uh, been at uh, PBN now since twenty fourteen. Well, how about that? I'm flies <laughs> at PBN. Yeah, when people think of some of the magazines and newspapers you've worked for, uh, the, the the term mainstream comes to my mind. Uh, you've worked for some of the most yeah. well-read, uh, well-respected uh, instruments out there. And yet, every now and then, I'm, I'm delighted and surprised. Uh, you, you'll come forth with some column that is filled with in, unconventional, even unpopular analysis of a controversial issue. I've always wondered, Cam, how do you get away with it? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I don't know. Well, you know, I've, 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 been, I've been lucky to, to work in supportive environments that, uh, that appreciate having a, a, a range of viewpoints. Um, I, I do worry about my industry overall in, in the long run in terms of how, how much permission people in my industry feel to, uh, to have dissenting opinions. Uh, I, I think overall it's becoming much harder for folks, uh, but uh, but I've, I've, I've been very lucky all along. I, I do try to be, uh, well, I try to do a lot of homework. I mean, each one of those columns, every week I think, oh my goodness, right. why did I want a weekly column? I, I, this is taking me hours to pull this together. I'm on deadline. I'm never going to be finished. Um, you know, at... Uh, and especially through the last 18 months of COVID, uh, where there's so much to research from the public policy standpoint. Uh, yeah, I've tried to be comparative, looking at what Hawaii's done uh, in comparison to what other uh, jurisdictions have done. There's the epidemiology aspect. There's the cultural aspect. There's the industry, my, my industry aspect in terms of the reporting and uh, how good a job it's how well it's being done. Uh, so, yeah, no, and I've already wandered away from your question. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know, you mentioned the, the coronavirus era, yeah. and uh, throughout it, we've been mystified at, at the reasons government officials have given to justify their right. actions. Right. Uh, you, you've been a great student of this, and so I wanted to ask you, and you've written on this, how transparent 
has our government been? Uh, what kind of grade would you give them? How, how do you assess their transparency? What do you think is going on there? Uh, I, I've been frustrated all along at the, the lack of transparency in terms of, of, of data-driven public policy, right? Uh, right. And, and it's at the state level as well as the, the county level. Uh, you know, when safe access came along, I asked the city and county of Honolulu with the new mayor. Uh, how did I, I, the, the, my question to them was how, when they announced safe access, right, with the new restrictions and requiring that uh, customers show their, their vaccine card or a negative test result. Uh, my question was how many cases, hospitalizations or deaths is this estimated to prevent? What's the estimated economic impact? And who did the modeling uh, for both of these that informed this decision? And the answer back was that Safe Access Honolulu was designed in collaboration uh, with health, business, and restaurant leaders as part of our collective efforts uh, to aggressively counteract the surge of COVID-19 cases. That's not the same as telling me, or more importantly, my readers, I mean, I. I'm trying to gather this stuff so that my all the business owners and business leaders, uh, everyone interested in a, in a good economy who reads PBN can can learn from what I'm able to get or learn from what I'm not able to get. And th there's no modeling, right? They, they didn't have any to share. And that's not any different than the Caldwell administration. Uh, uh, Caldwell was uh, quite irritated with me in an in a interview format just like this when I pressed for specific data. It's like, can, can you link a thing that you're requiring of all of us to a specific outcome? Uh, and and no, one, no one yet has been able to do that. Well, or, one of the- Even like a range, like, a, like, like give us a guess at least. Right. Well, one of the problems I hear you stating is that it's been difficult to get data in the first place. Right. It's been difficult on a more general level to right. get answers to the questions that you have as a journalist when you right. post them to government agencies and to government leaders. Uh, how's that make you feel? Uh, well, you know, personally frustrated. Uh, I, I do see, I think uh, it was at Civil Beat or the Advertiser recently uh, had a, a big story talking about the lack of transparency. Right. So, so I'm glad to see uh, that, that there's finally some some momentum building to demand some of these some of these answers um well know, this, I, this certainly begs the, the the question you were raising earlier about the basis on which government officials are making their right. decisions so what is your assessment so far can you tell as a journalist uh, whether government has been looking at the data in an objective way and basing and basing their decisions on data? Uh, I think that they have been uh, globally, not just in Hawaii. I mean, uh, anyone who's following this should, should read what's going on all around the world. There's been a, a fairly uniform approach towards dealing with this pandemic, uh, towards having it be... Uh, very top down from from government and very much handled as an economic intervention more than as a public health intervention. Uh, so I think that what they're looking at more than I mean, this is a guess on my part, right? I, I'm not a fly on the wall in these meetings. Um, I think that they're they're looking at kind of a shopping cart of, of public policy options more so than than data. Well, let's switch to the media now. Uh, over the last year and a half, uh, the coronavirus has been front and center in the media. Yeah. What, what do you make of the quality of the media's reporting about it? Well, my <laughs> second only to government in my, uh, my criticisms in the column uh, have been criticisms of my own industry. But that's, that's nothing new. I've been grumbling about my own industry as long as I've been in it. Uh, because it's such a privileged position to be in, you know, as, as the institution is supposed to help the public know what's going on. Uh, and and we, we do have access that uh, 
that the average citizen doesn't have, right? When you when when a politician knows that you represent tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of citizens through your audience, uh, they'll answer your your questions. Uh, and then when they don't, that's also significant. Uh, from the from the very beginning, I noticed that, uh, and again, this is global. It's not just Hawaii's media; it's the national media, it's the media uh, in other countries. Uh, from the, from the very beginning, there was a, this broad acceptance in the media of the of just the face value explanation that that there's this pandemic, and because of the pandemic, we in government need to do X Y Z. Uh, and I think that very early on, a lot of folks in media thought that their path to looking after their readers and asking the hard questions of government. It, it took the form of, you say this is a crisis, so why aren't you clamping down harder? Instead of asking, you say this is a crisis, so why are you choosing this policy instead of these others that we're aware of? Or why are you doing these actions when they're different from other actions in past pandemics? So there's been a lack of comparative analysis. There's been a lack of historical perspective uh, and, and, and I think an outcome of this is that media and government have fed into each other in this feedback loop of, of increasing clampdown. Well, you know, that's very interesting, uh, focusing primarily on what to do yeah. rather than the rationale behind it. Right. Uh, talking more about what is going on rather than asking the question, why is it going on? Right. Right. Or, or bringing up all kinds of correlations, but never right. getting to the actual causality of what's right, taking right. place. You know, there's some interesting psychological tells in, in the language that we all use to describe this time that we're in. Uh, when you see uh, media or government or just even everyday people you talk to, and they say, well, because of COVID X, Y, Z. Well, COVID, it's just a virus. It doesn't make any decisions for us. Only humans can make decisions about what humans are doing. Uh, and, and so if, if we were being more complete of, in our understanding of what we were going through, we would more often be saying, because of COVID policies, this has happened and that has happened and this was closed and that's open and that's not open and this is being asked of us. Right, but, but no one says because of COVID policies. It's very rare to, to see that formulation. I understand that, that you know it, it's extra work to add that word in, and, and at PBN we probably aren't doing it as often as we probably should. Uh, it's 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 easy in shorthand to say well because COVID, but really it's because COVID policies. You know, Cam. Uh, today I was reading in the Honolulu Star Advertiser. Uh, the, the following statement, flu proves deadlier than COVID. And, right. and it, what it said is that uh, the flu and pneumonia have killed over 800 people this season. And, and when I read that, I, I was kind of shocked for a right. minute because th th that hasn't really been in the headlines. No. And no. The, the number 800 for this season for flu and pneumonia alone uh, dwarfs the number of deaths from the coronavirus, right. which has constantly been in the in the media. Right. Uh, what are your thoughts about this? I'm a little flummoxed. Uh, very early on in the pandemic, when I was trying to put the threat of coronavirus into a historical context, I was using State Department of Health influenza surveillance reports uh, to point out that every single year there, there's X number of fatalities in Hawaii from a communicable viral disease. Well, pneumonia is bacterial, but it, it typically starts with you catching some sort of upper respiratory viral infection. Uh, you know, and, and to say, well, if we were to panic every year in the exact same way we're panicking now, uh, you know, we'd never, we would never have an economy. We would never leave our home. Well, not too long after that, those those weekly reports vanished from the State Department of Health website, and they stayed gone for the longest time. I haven't had a chance to look yet to see if those weekly reports have returned to the website, and that's what uh, Star Advertiser was basing their their article on. 
so that my gut reaction was, well, this is interesting to see. And, and I read the piece and I can't quite tell if it's an attempt to return to perspectives or if it's softening us up for the idea that we need to keep acting like this now because of the flu every year. Where, where are we going with this comparison? And one of my concerns has been if we lower the threshold for what justifies this all-encompassing response to a problem, to do something, you know, to a level of threat that, that we used to just accept as normal, then, we've, then we're inviting in a permanent state of crisis. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's, that's my reaction to it. Well, that's something worth pondering. We're going to take a quick break now, and uh, my guest today is Cam Napier, Editor-in-Chief of Pacific Business News. We'll be right back, and uh, don't go away, because when we come back, I'm going to ask uh, Cam a question about UH football. Oh. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Joshua Cooper, and welcome to Cooper Union. We look at what's happening with human rights around the world, and we invite you to tune in every Tuesday where we feature the voices of the people from the front lines sharing the struggles for self-determination, for the importance of sustainability and solidarity with one another to make the world a better place for all of humanity. If you can't catch it live, you can also Look at thinktechhawaii.com, as well as on Vimeo and many other places to catch the amazing shows where we hear from authors, activists, academics, analysts, and artists who are contributing to positive social change around the planet. Aloha Mekapono. Thank you for joining us for Justice. Well, we're back and you're still here. Thank you very much. I'm Kili'i Akina. You're watching Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. And my guest today is Cam Napier. We've been talking about the, the puzzling way in which government justifies what it's been doing during the coronavirus pandemic. And uh, one reason that happens to be with UH football. Apparently, our mayor of Honolulu and our governor have reversed their original stance and are now opening up the stadium so that some spectators can come in, which is a great thing. I mean, I, I'm all for that, and uh, I, I'm excited about that, and I do think our, our Rainbow Warriors need to have an audience. But when I sit back and I try to answer the question, why? What was the data? Did something change that I, I didn't see? Uh, I, I'm, I'm a bit puzzled about this. Cam, what are your thoughts about that? Well, to me, it, it it fits into a larger pattern that's been consistent from the, the very beginning of the policy response, which is uh, seemingly arbitrary distinctions made between essential and non-essential businesses. Uh, that and, and, you know, I, I wrote about it a bit when Safe Access was announced that uh, it's very strange that you know, a bar is dangerous, but a bank is not. A restaurant will kill you, but grocery shopping is totally okay. Um, and, and I think a lot of people have seen the, the weirdness of this, right? That um, this was a big source of, of tension earlier in the pandemic when a lot of local businesses were essentially shut down, but major corporate stores um, were, were declared essential and allowed to stay open. Uh, and and a, Apparently, it in great safety, right? They, we did not see like a wave of deaths of, of Walmart employees or shoppers or Costco employees or shoppers, which then, you know, if you observe that, you might start to wonder, well, why are we making these, this, these distinctions if things are apparently fairly safe for most people most of the time? Uh, well, it, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's kind of like the ineffability of the changing goalposts. Right. Originally, right. we were going to, quote unquote, flatten the curve. Right. Right. And then we got to the place where we were eager to, to get through these different tiers, one, two, three, four. Um, and, and we discovered at the, the end of tier four, there was a, a tier five. Right. And um, 
we've all been rooting for the day when we would get 70% immunization and that would change things, but apparently that's not the goalposts position any longer. What are your thoughts about these shifting goalposts? Well, that's been an enormous frustration for a lot of people. Uh, it's It's been difficult for uh, for the PBN readers, who are, like I've said, they're business owners and business leaders. You know, and the uncertainty is as much a problem as as the restrictions, right? So if they there's a specific direct connection between saying, well, a restaurant could only have fifty percent capacity and and a restaurant's revenues. Uh, that's almost mathematical precision, but there's the broader uncertainty of the moving goalposts, the changing regulations, where it, it makes it very difficult for businesses to plan, you know, whether or not they uh, should bring employees back, for example, uh, whether or not they should be ordering more supplies or fewer supplies, uh, whether or not they should even stay in business. Uh, we, we spoke to uh, the head of Kelo Chamber of Commerce as part of a panel discussion recently, and his his business, Robert Reich, his, his day job, he uh, helps people with financial planning for their businesses, their exit strategies. He's got clients that are telling him, look, I want out faster. I know I had a plan to exit my business uh, pre-COVID on a certain timetable, but I want out much faster now. Uh, so that that broader uncertainty has been a big challenge for business in Hawaii. Certainly, and with, with respect to what the goal really is, it, it makes it very difficult to keep score if, if it's not clear. Right. As you know, uh, our governor has in recent n- n- uh, n- um, press uh, venues been uh, vacillated between being uh, highly optimistic about the possibility that we can open up a little bit sooner to being pessimistic, uh, even right. making mention that there might need to be a universal vaccine mandate. Right. And yet when pressed, he says it's it's not known yet what the metric will be by right, which right. we make that decision. Uh, right. Your thoughts about that? Well, I think that's why a lot of people have a hard time with mandates. When, when, the, when the, there's that much uncertainty, a lot of a lot of people would rather government be upfront about the uncertainty and say, "Here's what we think is your safest course of action," but we we leave it to you to make your own decisions. Uh, it's very difficult for people to accept mandates that that seem untethered, you know, and and especially when you keep in mind that uh, we're still operating under emergency powers. We still don't really have a, a, a true functional democracy at the moment. Uh, you know, I mean, I guess the legislature can pass laws on anything but COVID. But when it comes to the public health emergency, we're, we're still very much at the mercy of, of unitary decisions. Uh, and, you know, that to get public buy in, uh, you got to be a little more persuasive and less coercive, I think, if you want to be an effective public policy leader. Um, you know, the, well, it's a whole other thing to talk about vaccine mandates, perhaps, but uh, the, yeah, it's, it's all been very strange. We've seen uh, in the recent past our healthcare system uh, overwhelmed under the surge in demand. Right. And that has often been put forth as the main reason that government officials um, have opted for various restrictions. Right. It's based upon the limitations of our healthcare system. Uh, one of the things that we've exposed at the Grassroot Institute is that that was the condition of our healthcare system even before the pandemic. Right, right, it, right. It's nothing new. It, it's the result of various government regulations, certificate of demand, uh, certificate of need uh, regulations, uh, the regulatory environment about around. Uh, practicing a medical business and, and so forth. So w- why do you think that that is used as the main reason for the lockdowns rather than something that we actually solve? Well, I think in the short term, it seems much easier to control all of us than to overhaul an industry. That's one answer that comes to mind. And, and you know, to be fair on the, on the previous question, uh, the Delta variant seemed very different. It was behaving very differently from the original version. So, yeah, you know, 
it, it it's not surprising that some goalposts would would move in response to that. That that seems safe, but um, but yeah, I think you know in the short term that's that's the explanation. Is is just like with two weeks to flatten the curve, it is much easier uh, to order all of us to stay home or to to operate our businesses at half capacity or, or what have you, or vaccine mandates than, than it is to to will a, a larger and better industry into shape. There are things that are just outright missing in the workforce development picture in Hawaii. Uh, I recently interviewed Kathy Rathel. She's uh, uh, retired recently as president and CEO of Castle Medical Center. And we were talking about workforce development. She pointed out uh, there's no training in Hawaii for physical therapists, for example. It's just one medical specialty, right? Uh, so Hawaii kids go to the mainland for school for that, and uh, maybe they stay because they found a cheaper place to live and more professional opportunities. Uh, but in any case, they they have to leave for the training, and then you, we we have to kind of entice them back. Um, but I have been puzzled at why nationwide there hasn't been more of this emergency crisis mindset applied to beefing up healthcare uh, than to controlling the, the, the broad general public or controlling the economy as a response to, to the pandemic. Uh, 18 months is, is a long time. You know, I, I, I mentioned in my column this week, uh, if we're talking about like the federal government responding to a wartime emergency, uh, how many submarines the Portsmouth Navy Yard could crank out? at the beginning of World sure. War II and at the end of World War II. When it matters, the, the government can make production accelerate. I haven't really seen a national effort commensurate to that or, or uh, comparable to that uh, in terms of, of increasing healthcare capacity. Right. I don't know why. I don't know why that is. And, and certainly increasing our healthcare capacity would be on the top of things to do yeah. as we prepare for potential future Pandemics. Right. We've just got about 30 seconds left, Cam. What could our government have done better? What should we do in the future? Just real quickly. Oh, uh, real quickly. Uh, you know, more should have been uh, voluntary guidelines, and I and I think not just because it's ethically right, but because it's more effective as public health policy. As soon as people feel bullied, then they react to the force that they feel coming at them, whether or not it's the best health decision they could make. And, and so I think the mandates are counterproductive in that regard. And, uh, and I think the, the, the public, we all could do a better job of, of asking better questions about what's going on around us uh, rather than just jumping on to the drama of the situation. I think that that's been a big factor in what's been going on for the last 18 months. Well, Cam, thank you very much. Great information today, and I hope people will continue to read you in Pacific Business News. Cam Napier, Editor-in-Chief, and uh, delighted to have you on board today. And to everyone else, until next time, we'll see you on Hawaii Together on the ThinkTech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kaylee Akina, signing off now. Aloha.